from the London News Studios, this is a Vox Evening News. The headlines tonight. Zambia's President Michael Sata, nicknamed King Cobra for his sharp tongue and manner, dies at 77, making his Vice President Africa's first white head of state in decades. Rwanda develops a flexi biogas method of capturing methane gas from cow dung to create a clean biogas to burn as fuel. British Prime Minister clashes with the opposition leader in Parliament over immigration. MPs label UK's border and immigration control system a mess. Hello and welcome. I am Akintayo at Dito Kumbo. We kick off from Southern Africa. Zambia's Guy Scott became Africa's first white head of state in 20 years this morning after the president, Michael Sata, died in a London hospital aged 77. Scott, a Cambridge-educated economist born to Scottish parents, was Sata's vice president. He takes over as interim leader until an election in three months, making him the first white African leader since South Africa's F.W. de Klerk lost to Nelson Mandela in the 1994 election that ended apartheid. In a brief televised address, Scott confirmed presidential elections would take place within 90 days and announced the immediate commencement of a period of national mourning. Annalise says 70-year-old Scott would not be eligible to run for the presidency because of citizenship restrictions. Sata, whose varied CV included stints as a policeman, car assembly worker, trade unionist and platform sweeper at London's Victoria Station, left Zambia on October 19 for medical treatment, accompanied by his wife and family members, but never made it back home alive. Annalise say his death could prompt a rise in investment in the country. Sata is the third president Zambia has lost in the last six years. Two of them died while in office. Let's move to Lusaka to hear from Zambians as they mourn their president. It feels so sad for our country because it's our third president to die. So this time is, we need prayers for our country. We are saddened by the, the, by the break of the news that the president has died. We are so sad. There must be something wrong in Zambia. So what we're supposed to do is to commit this country to, to God and to find out why is it happening only to us, to Zambians. And, uh, what I can just appeal to the whole country is to remain calm and uh, just allow what has happened and uh, let's close hands together and be in prayer and strengthen one another through Christ Jesus. I just can't believe it. It's a very shocking news. Like seriously, this is a great loss. I really feel bad. Well, let's move to West Africa. Trade unions in Burkina Faso have called a general strike following a day of protests against long-serving President Blaise Compare that saw hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. Demonstrators wielding iron bars and stones battled police in the capital Ouagadougou on Tuesday after a massive rally against plans to extend the rule of the veteran president. The opposition has called for a blockade of parliament on Thursday when a legislature examines a proposed constitutional amendment that would allow Compare to seek another term next year. Schools and universities have closed for the week of planned protests. The United States said it was concerned by the spirit and intent behind the draft bill to scrap the presidential term limits. It's time for a field update on the fight against the deadly Ebola virus in West Africa. The head of the United Nations Ebola Response Mission says the battle to contain the deadly virus is being made all the more difficult because of weak data. Also, the Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crossing Societies, El Haj Asay, is calling for more people, equipment and logistics in the fight. What I will say is that decisions should be based on science and facts and not hype and hysteria. And decisions should be taken in a way that will promote the most rapid, effective response to the Ebola crisis in West Africa as possible. And anything that will dissuade uh, foreign trained personnel uh, 
to, from coming here to West Africa and joining us on the front line to fight the fight would be very, very unfortunate. One of our biggest challenges, we just don't have good information. The data is very weak, so we don't know exactly the total number of people who have the disease. We don't know really what the transmission rates are, are or transmission patterns. We don't know exactly the geographical location. So it's very hard to do uh, an emergency response of this nature when you don't know exactly what your uh, wh where the people in need are and so we're calling on you know everybody to contribute as much as they can because those who are on the ground are quite overstretched you know, right now we need a lot of uh, logistic transports because we need to transport the deceased people for the burials and all the other products that to, you need to and require for decontamination so in some, it is just doing the same, but at a larger scale, much larger scale. Child marriage is illegal in Ivory Coast, and yet its practice is widespread throughout the West African nation. However, a recent case involving an 11-year-old girl being married off by a father has resulted in the father's arrest and possible prison sentence in a landmark case which many hope may alter attitudes for good. From behind her desk, one shy young student is hiding from the cameras. Unwittingly, she's become the center of a landmark lawsuit. Her father is the first man ever tried in Ivory Coast over child marriage. Aged 11, she was set to be married to her 27-year-old cousin. But the school alerted the police about her absence from class and her father was arrested. In a country where child marriage is illegal but the practice remains widespread, it's hoped this case could be key to changing attitudes. When we've raised awareness and people know in the camps and the most remote areas that child marriage is a punishable offence, we'll be more strict and more severe. This trial pits the country's courts against tradition, morality and religion. The young girl's uncle is adamant the union is legitimate. The Muslim religion recommends this. It says when a woman first has her period, she can marry. It's a widely held belief. UNICEF says 12% of girls in Ivory Coast under the age of 15 are married. Local NGOs struggle against people's entrenched religious beliefs and the fear of shame. In their community, it's forbidden. It's bad to have sex outside of marriage or to fall pregnant outside of wedlock. So to prevent children falling pregnant outside of marriage, many families prefer to marry them off earlier. But the UN says early marriage robs girls of education and health, risking their lives with early and repeated pregnancies. This case could be the start of a fundamental shift in attitudes and the lives of girls in Ivory Coast. So in the same vein as Uganda's Supreme Court debates the practice of paying a bride price as a precondition to marriage, villagers offer their take on whether it helps preserve traditions or makes women more vulnerable to domestic abuse and other forms of violence. When Rosa Kroot became engaged, her parents were thrilled. Her future husband paid what's known as a bride price, in this case of four cows, four goats, and the equivalent of $75 before leaving with her to his village. Six months later, the violence began. Repeated beatings that left her with permanent damage to her hearing. Eventually, she ran back to her parents, who paid for her freedom by reimbursing the bride price. He has made my daughter suffer and made her old. She's worked in his home, farmed the land, and yet she has gained nothing. In Uganda, as in many other African countries, the bride price has long been considered a respected tradition. But in recent years, it's turned marriage into a business, forcing girls as young as 14 to wed. According to local women's rights agency, Mifumi, the practice can trap women in violent relationships and leave men financially crippled. 
They've now launched a landmark case seeking to have these transactions declared optional by the Supreme Court. And you have to respect the parents irrespective of what, whether they beat you or whether they hate you, you have to love his parents and then you have to love him. As long as he's paid your dowry, even if this violence. For Jana Akiding, who also escaped from a violent marriage, the risk of her daughter ending up in a similar situation is just too high. <laughs> I don't want my daughters to get married, with or without a dowry. I want them to get an education. Through that education, they'll be empowered. But Janet's views are not the norm. Even if the court declares the bride price optional, the custom remains firmly entrenched, and for many Ugandans will continue unabated. Well, let's move away from traditional practices that are still controversial in Africa and to good news for rural Africans. The United Nations International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, in partnership with the Rwandan government, has developed a flexi biogas method of capturing methane to create a clean biogas. And so far, more than 100 households in Rwanda are burning biogas as fuel. In Rwanda's eastern province, Pacific Musabiemana collects dung from a cow, mixes it with water and pours it into the funnel for a so-called flexi biogas system. After a few days of fermentation in the plastic reservoir, methane gas released from dung is sent through plastic pipes straight to the kitchen stove. What is left of cow dung after gas extraction is a potent organic fertilizer which Pacific uses for a vegetable garden and sells the leftovers to our neighbors. She also invested in a solar panel and a converter. Apart from lighting the house at night, she charges her neighbors' mobile phones for a fee. Cow dung releases methane gas which is 22 times more damaging to the atmosphere than CO2. An, I, an IFA's renewable energy officer explains how beneficial flexi biogas is. But first, let's hear from Rwandan farmer Pacific. Since I've received the flexi biogas, I can cook, I can have light, I can buy some salt, I don't have to buy firewood or oil anymore. The money I save, I can use for other things. It's very easy. With one car, and this flexi biogas, which is easy to, to install, to repair and maintain. You get enough gas for cooking and the biosilari, which is a good fertilizer for your farm. Still to come. Russia unveils 2018 Football World Cup logo. FIFA opposes boycott. MPs say British border and immigration control system is a mess. 39,000 year, 39, year old baby mammoth goes on display in central Moscow. Those stories are more after this short break. I'll see you soon.